in 2013, uh, a group from the Toronto Centre went to the uh, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, and uh, the Mississauga Centre, of which I'm also a member, uh, had it, and I put my name in for the uh, uh, lottery, and I was successful, so I enjoyed a great second, uh, second visit. Uh, this is where uh, Art McDonald won a Nobel Prize where the experiment was done and it was filled with heavy water and it picked up evidence that uh, of neutrinos and that they had mass and they uh, changed type of neutrinos as they went from the sun and it solved a major, uh, uh, major issue in science. So, there. Um, They've since enlarged the facility and made a large lab with a, a bunch of uh, rooms, and it's called Snow Lab, so it's Sudbury Neutrino Observatory Lab, so the acronym police can uh, make sure I uh, explain that properly. And uh, I just saw this picture of somebody in a, a zodiac uh, in the water that uh, was used, and that was kind of neat. Um, they have a large building at the Creighton Mine in Sudbury with uh, uh, all sorts of uh, offices, etc., and also a place where we change that will be shown in the video. And uh, I don't know if I got the right uh, shaft, but we went down shaft number nine, and this is not a toy. The, um, it goes down two and a half kilometers, although not quite that far to the, the place, and they have great big drums with cables to lower us down and uh, everything. And I kind of like this because it shows the um, vein of uh, nickel and copper ore. It's about 2.5% for both. Uh, it was open pit mined originally, and then they uh, realized it went down, so they follow it down, and they drill a shaft, and then they run drifts across to it. And at about the two kilometer, a little below the two kilometer level, they took this drift that went to the ore body, and then they extended it a little bit, and that's where they made the original Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, and then as part of it, they had uh, Snow Lab. So let's see if I can figure this Thank you. So here's a video that Snow Lab produces that I'll just. <sighs> Oop, don't fall the asleep in me, please. Snow Lab starts in the early morning at Creighton Mine near Sudbury, Ontario. The surface building hosts offices, laboratories, and support services. It's here where you begin to gear up. The process starts in the dry, a name given to the shower and change rooms. It's here where you change into your clothes for underground, normally shorts and a t-shirt, as the temperature underground can easily reach the mid-30s. Over this outfit, you must wear a set of mining coveralls, waterproof safety boots, a hard hat, safety glasses, and a mining belt. All this gear is required to travel safely down into the mine. Everyone entering the mine must tag in so that there is a record on surface of who's underground at all times. The final piece of equipment you need before heading underground is a cap lamp. The battery pack attaches to the mining belt and the light attaches to the front of the hard hat. You join other Snow Lab staff to wait for the cage, the large elevator that brings people and materials to and from the surface. It's a tight squeeze as you descend 6,800 feet, over two kilometers, in just a few minutes. They gave us gum to swallow. You experience 25 to 30 percent more air pressure at that depth, and the descent feels similar to flying in an airplane. Snow Lab is located at this depth to shield sensitive experiments from the cosmic radiation at the Earth's surface. Two kilometers deep. Once arriving at the 6800 level, watch your step as you enter the drift. The drift is the main part of the mine. It's important to keep your cap lamp on and to watch your step during the two kilometer walk from the cage to snow lab. Uh, 
I think about here is where the vein of ore was, Snow but I'm not sure. A clean lab, meaning dust and dirt must be kept to a bare minimum. Mine dust, in particular, can interfere with experiments if it gets into the lab area. For these reasons, strict cleanliness protocols are in place. Everything that enters the lab must be thoroughly cleaned. That includes people. The first step is to wash the mud and dust off your boots before entering the lab doors. As you step into the lab, you notice a temperature change immediately. The conditions in the lab are well regulated to keep a constant temperature and humidity. At this point, everyone must remove their hard hats and belts and hang them on the hooks along the wall. Remove your boots and safety glasses and place them on the shelves. Remember where you've placed your boots. The next step is to head to the underground dry. Upstairs for women, downstairs for men. There is a dirty side and a clean side to the dry, separated by showers. Anything that has been in the drift must remain on the dirty side. To ensure the lab stays as clean as possible, everyone showers to remove any remaining dust that may linger on skin or hair. You are provided with safety boots, a t-shirt, and clean room suit following your shower. These outfits remain underground and are washed in laundry facilities in the lab to eliminate the possibility of getting contaminated by mine dust in traveling to and from the surface. You also need to wear a hairnet, safety glasses, and hard hat in the lab. As you leave the dry and enter the lunchroom, everyone must tag in again to keep track of who is in the lab. The lunchroom is the heart of Snow Lab and also functions as the lab's refuge station. In case of an emergency, staff and visitors would congregate here. Scientists, staff, and visitors will spend eight hours underground, working on experiments, building the newest areas of the lab, and maintaining the facility. At the end of the day, you and the rest of the Snow Lab crew pack up and head back to surface. The Snow Lab crew will be back prepared to do the same thing all over again tomorrow. And this is an example of, I think it's one of the larger rooms that they have that are available, and many of you saw it. Something it didn't show, but now they have um, sticky um, pads that you walk across to pick up any dust and dirt that's uh, on your feet as you are there. They're all sorts of, wait, wait a minute, that's the, the wrong one. So now I'm going to start the main, uh, main talk, and I'm going to talk about the PICO experiment, and it's used to search for dark matter that might or might not exist. I don't know what PICO stands for, by the way. It's a combination of two acronymed experiments that combined together, and one was PI and the other one was CO, but uh, anyway. Uh, oh, I forgot to say, uh, everybody know who's that, who that is, eh? Stephen Hawking came down, and he is right next to a um, corrugated uh, cylinder, vertical cylinder, and uh, that's the actual experiment. So he was right there. Okay, question. This is a bottle of water, and uh, what temperature could that water be? What do you think the hottest would be before somebody couldn't hold it anymore? 30, 40, 50, something like that. What's the coldest temperature liquid water can be? 
We learned that. We learned that in uh, this is pure water. Uh, I learned that in school that it's uh, 32 or uh, or zero. But this guy is about. This is taken from video. He's about to hit it, and as soon as he hits it, ice forms, because that's super cool. It's actually below zero, but because the it doesn't have a site to start freezing, it doesn't freeze until it's jiggled. So this is super cooled. Now it works the other way too. Here's water that the video says is heated to 105. And what they, uh, what they did is they just lifted this side a little bit and dropped it. And doing that, you got bubbles forming. And that's because the water was superheated. It's not quite ready to boil because it doesn't have a site to boil on. And as soon as you diggle it or add something, it, uh, it boils. Now, um, I like to think of it another way. Uh, water boils at 100 degrees C at sea level. On top of Mount Everest, it's 71 because the pressure is less. And if you carried this uh, pot of water at 100 degrees C up Mount Everest, Eventually, if you jiggle it, it's going to bubble or, uh, you know, if it's 100 degrees or else uh, eventually the pressure will get so low it's going to be. Now, the official term is superheated, but I'd like to think of under pressured. If you have something at boiling point at one pressure and you reduce the pressure, it's going to be um, uh, ready to bubble. Donald Glasser, I think, is the only scientist who ever won a Nobel Prize for drinking beer. He observed bubbles, and I tried taking photos, and it's very difficult to take photos of bubbles in beer, uh, which surprises me. But he figured these bubbles form, especially when you add salt, which was a hideous behavior we did when I was at university. And he thought, hey, there's a way we can identify particles. Because when particles from something go through this liquid that's superheated or under pressured, it's going to form bubbles as it goes through. And if you put a magnetic field around it, the magnetic field is going to cause the charged particles to bend. And from the amount of bending, you can work out properties of it. And you use a camera and take all sorts of pictures. And you have a bubble chamber. And this is the first bubble chamber. It had liquid hydrogen. And the magnetic field caused some particles to bend. And from that, you can work out the particles of the, or properties of the uh, uh, particle. This is the PICO site. And remember, I talked about the uh, vertical cylinder. And it's sort of like a culvert type material. Um, we're at the bottom, and I have another picture taken from the top, so notice, and this is our, our uh, team leader, and we were all uh, uh, getting good descriptions of how it worked. The working fluid when we were there is C3F8, and its boiling point is uh, roughly minus, 30 or minus 40 degrees C, and it just takes a little bit of extra pressure to keep it as a liquid. Why fluorine? Well, they're looking for particles that have a spin interaction with protons that have a spin. And it's got an odd number of protons, so you're going to have a bigger factor. And the other thing about fluorine is all fluorine atoms that are non-radioactive have 10 neutrons and 9 uh, protons. So they're very uh, pure for the experiment. And this is a diagram of it. And this is inside that uh, culvert-like thing. So you have your, your tower. Uh, here's the C3F8 that everybody calls it, not octo, whatever it is, fluorine. Um, they have a layer of water. They have bellows. And at the critical time, they pull up on the bellows. It gets under pressured. Any, press any particles that are whizzing through this are going to cause bubbles. And the cameras and or the acoustic sensors pick it up. Um, and given that this is buried under two kilometers of dirt, there's very little radiation from outer space. And it's also in a, uh, this big uh, culvert type structure with water that I'll show in a bit. And that reduces all the interference as much as possible to have a good noise. We were roughly, the lady I showed the picture of was roughly there looking up. And now we're looking down. And I'm going to show. Uh, the same picture a little bit later. 
Here it's filled with water, ready to go. And I think they cycle, they pull the bellows a bit, they reduce the pressure, they take all sorts of photos, and uh, they run it for a number of months. And the 1916 paper on, how do you pronounce it, archive? The website? Uh, and this is from 19, or sorry, 2016, and there are 58 authors involved in this collaboration. And they were looking for wimps. Now, the um, galaxies and stars within galaxies move at a different speed than they would expect from the amount of matter they can see. So they figure something is causing it to not work, and, and this is what dark matter is all about. And one possible form of dark matter, it's like a needle in a haystack, you're looking at all sorts of different ways, are called wimps. Weakly interacting, massive particles. And I'm going to show a graph from the 2016 paper that one, one axis is the interaction and the other is the mass of particles. So here we go. So on the bottom, they have mass, but instead of giving in uh, kilograms or whatever, it's given in giga electron volts per C squared equals MC squared. And I converted that this is roughly one proton, that's 10, that's 100,000, 10,000, there's a logarithmic scale. So this is the mass of particle size. They're not like neutrinos that are something like a millionth of an electron mass, they're, they're, uh, they're quite heavy. Now, it's a little harder to explain this cross-sectional area. This is the weakly interacting. I've read that in a second, something like a trillion neutrinos go through my hand. Now, there's very little interaction between the neutrinos in my hand because they don't interact very much, and they have a small cross-sectional area. And this is the cross-sectional area between the hypothetical wimp that we're trying to find and a proton. And they are looking for how much it is going to um, uh, uh, be uh, affected. So um, basically what the experiment, oh wait a minute, I forgot. Um, it turns out helium atoms are 10 times, uh, 10 billion times larger or 100 billion billion times smaller cross-sectional or larger cross-sectional area than the, um, uh, this value here. So we're talking about really small interactions between particles and that's what they're looking for. Now, they started PICO and they had two liters of whatever the fluid was. It wasn't necessarily C3H uh, or F8. Uh, and they got this curve and they're saying, we know with statistical certainty that there's no WIMP that is above the line. Now, there might be some hints of something underneath, but they couldn't get statistical evidence, so they didn't report it. Then in 19, or 2006, Pardon me. In 2016, they did a 60 liter version. It was actually 57. And um, they found uh, they got a lower curve and there are no wimps here. Uh, it turns out that various theories predict that, uh, this is string theory that I don't have a lot of faith in. Um, there are various theories that predict that probably if there's a WIMP, it's going to be somewhere in this region. Remember, this is mass, and this is how weakly it interacts, and the less interaction is down. Now, then they did another one paper published in 2019, and they used the C3F8 instead of the other fluid. And the curve for the previous version of PICO is here. And the new curve is something like 60 times more sensitive. And it's also sensitive to even lighter particles than the previous one. So they're expanding the area that they can examine. And as per the other one, there's no WIMP particles with properties above here but who knows about down here. There are other lines from other experiments, and I noticed the 16 graph had some lines that went way down, and the 19 graph didn't have them. So I wonder if uh, they were studies that later on they figured are not that valid. So, gravitational waves were discovered because they kept 
finding, they couldn't find any, so they tweak the equipment and they make it better, and then they go again and again, and eventually they found gravitational waves. So, scientists don't give up as long as they get the money, so they're going to do a Pico 500 version, and it's uh, all sorts of equipment for it are in the various hallways of Snow Lab, but they haven't uh, started to build it yet. Um, this is the same picture I showed you before, and my understanding is it's going to go somewhere there, and um, uh, they're going to set it up. It's not much taller, but it's uh, much further out, so uh, it's going to go there, and it's going to be more sensitive. They're going to do various changes. My understanding is they don't need the water buffer anymore. They found a way around the water buffer with an experiment in Germany. And uh, there are other ways it's going to be more sensitive, more acoustic sensors, more cameras. And what they're going to do is push the limit. So what we're exploring here is an unknown region looking for particles that could explain the way our universe fits together. And we're looking for more weakly interacting than has been found before. And I was told for certain types of particles, this is the most sensitive experiment in the world. And it was an honor to see scientists boldly going. Thank you very much. They found any dark matter candidates, or it's just reducing the possibilities? Um, the latter. They've eliminated certain combinations of mass and uh, interaction. Now, it could be the actual WIMPs are even less interacting than they found so far, but uh, they have not, to my knowledge, published any, we found this. All right, now it could be if news come out, they found something, it's you have to do enough experiments to get statistical confidence. And uh, nobody said we have strong hints, but we don't quite have that yet, but uh, they're working on it. Okay. I don't know if, if at some time the Toronto Center is going to organize a trip to Snow Lab, but it's quite a, it's quite a trip, and I encourage you, if, uh, if somebody does organize it, and it's a lot of time to make all the arrangements, uh, I encourage you to try and go on it, because it's quite a, quite a place to visit. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks. Is this, this is the only facility in the world, right, that's doing this type of thing? OK. For, for one type of particle, yeah. this is the most sensitive detector. There are other types of possible particles that could be, and they have completely different experiments, but many of them work the same way that they're looking for photomultipliers that look for evidence of, of things. But, so, but at the same facility? What's that? At this facility? Then. No, there, there are places in Italy and there are places in China. So this is not the only one, but the scientists that we talked to at this he told me, you know, I asked the question. He said, for certain types of particles, this is the most sensitive experiment in the world. And that was nice to see. All right. Thank you very much, Ron. You're welcome. Thank you.